Good evening and welcome. I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and I want to welcome you to the third event of the 2017-18 Arts and Humanities Dean's Lecture Series. Please come in and be seated and don't worry. <laughs> um, over the eight years of the Dean's Lecture Series, we have sought to make this series dynamic and timely by inviting guest speakers to engage in thought-provoking conversations, lectures, and presentations about important ideas addressed in their work. We have invited them to share stories that inform our understanding of contemporary issues and challenges. Our aim has and continues to be promoting community, generating stimulating conversations that encourage us to think in critical and creative ways and facilitating those processes both on campus and in the surrounding community. In planning the series this year, we felt compelled to speak to issues that are troubling this campus, our nation, and the world. Ideological polarization that is stoked by fear and ethnocentrism and often expressed as hate and bias. Our themed series, therefore, has been an effort to confront these issues head on, so to speak, by bringing us together to consider rhetoric and actions that sow bigotry and malice. Organized around the theme, Courageous Conversations, our hue resists, our hue is our colloquial name for those of you who don't know that, College of Arts and Humanities. Our hue resists hate and bias. This season has featured three speakers whose work confronts these difficult issues through personal, political, and historical frames of reference. Two things inspired the title for the series. First, a TED Talk in which our first speaker talked about the need for courageous conversations. It takes courage to speak with honesty and to listen empathically to views that are antithetical to our own. It also takes courage to name recurrent themes in American history that many would like to forget or believe have been eradicated. By using the term resist, we declare that we are actively engaged in pushing back against the sentiments and actions associated with hate and bias. We are seeking to be proactive, not just reactive, in creating constructive ways to address difference. Our campus is committed to engaging these issues, and this series is among a number of college and campus-wide efforts to promote listening, dialogue, and action around diversity and inclusion. We're honored tonight to have as our final speaker of this year's series, the award-winning journalist and national public radio political correspondent, Mara Lyason. In her talk, The Political Landscape Dealing with Hate and Bias in Washington, Ms. Lyason will discuss the emerging national discourse of hate bias incidents from her particular political lens. You will remember that I said that one of our goals is to facilitate stimulating conversations and critical dialogue on campus and in the community. So I invite you to add your voice to the voices of others who are resisting hate and bias by participating in the conversation on Twitter at hashtag A-R-H-U-D-L-S and in the question and answer that will follow the lecture. And finally, I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, and I also want to thank the staff of the Dean's Office who work throughout the year to plan and conduct a successful series. So at this time, I'd like to um, ask you to join me in welcoming Associate Dean Linda Aldory from the college who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. For most of us, Mara Eliasson really needs no introduction. She's been the national political correspondent for NPR for over 30 years. She has also been a contributor to Fox News Channel since 1997, serving as a panelist on Special Report with Brett Baer and Fox News Sunday. Eliasson got her start at NPR as a general assignment reporter and newscaster. 
She covered Congress and served as the White House correspondent during all eight years of the Clinton administration. Now as the national political correspondent, her reports can be heard on the award-winning All Things Considered and Morning Edition. During her time with NPR, she has covered all the president elect presidential elections since 1992. She is an expert on elections, national policy, and on relations between the White House and Congress. Liason has received numerous awards and honors for her reporting, including a budget fellowship in economics and business journalism and the White House Correspondents Association's Merriman Smith Award in 94, 95, and 97 for excellence in daily news reporting. Please help me welcome Mara Liason to the podium now. Thank you very much for that really nice introduction. I am really happy to be here. And I am going to be talking about politics, which, as you all know, comes from the Greek word polis, which means many, and ticks, which means blood-sucking insects. Um, and I'm going to give a kind of view of where I think we are right now in Washington with the president and Congress. I'm going to talk about back up a little and talk about how we came to this super polarized, hyper partisan state that we are in, and then talk a little bit about the 2018 elections, which is what I cover as the national political correspondent for NPR, uh, and then we'll have time for questions. But I am grateful that you have given me a chance to take a break from my usual programming, where on any given day, I'm not sure if I'm covering the House of Cards, the West Wing, the Sopranos, or King Lear. <laughs> um, but actually, I am covering the Trump show. And that is kind of what every journalist in Washington ends up covering these days. The Trump show is now in its second season. And not much is going on. Not. Uh, we're about to have a military strike on Syria. The president's personal lawyer's office was raided by the FBI, and the president is really mad about it and is considering, once again, shutting down the Mueller investigation. We may or may not be about to enter a trade war with China. And oh, yes, the deficit is about to hit a trillion dollars, and the House Speaker just announced he's not running for re-election. So covering Trump is like drinking, for, covering the Trump era is like drinking from a fire hose. Trump is like no other president. Now, all modern presidents are polarizing. Um, but there, in the Trump White House, there is no such thing as a secret and very little advance planning. So um, as I said, he's a very polarizing figure. All presidents are polarizing, but no one has been as polarizing as Donald Trump, kind of gets the kind of intense reactions, pro and con, that he does. I'm sure there are plenty of Trump lovers and haters here, even in this small room. And I'm going to try to do my best to explain what he's doing and why it matters. And when I started covering Trump in January, well, I covered him on the campaign too, but when he came into the White House, I kept a couple of questions in my mind. Number one, was Trump different in degree or kind from previous presidents? In other words, was he just a ruder, cruder version of a conservative Republican president? After all, so much of what he's been doing, his policies, his appointments, his executive actions, his judicial nominees, are what any traditional conservative president would do. That's why conservatives are so happy with him, even if they don't like some of the tweeting and the behavior and other things. Or was Trump something totally unique, a new phenomenon in the Oval Office? Would he be able in four or eight years to really transform democratic norms and institutions, to scramble electoral coalitions, um, and kind of permanently alter America's role in the world? So that was question number one. Question number two was, could I tell my listeners the difference between the truly consequential and the merely outrageous? Or sometimes they're one and the same thing. But that was, these are questions that I've tried to keep in my mind. So where are we right now? Right now, I would say we're in a new phase of the Trump presidency. And this is what I call the one-man band phase or the solo act phase. Because Congress is not going to pass much of anything for the rest of the year except maybe confirm some new cabinet members, uh, 
maybe if there's a Supreme Court vacancy, have that. But the legislating phase of the first half of the Trump administration is over. And depending on what happens in November, the legislating phase of the first term is pretty much over. Congress's number one job this year is to try to sell the one big thing that they passed last year, and that's tax cuts. So Congress has really taken a back seat. Trump is on center stage pretty much by himself. The stuff that is gonna happen are things that a president can do by himself, like foreign policy, trade, executive actions, um, like what he's planning to do with the DACA recipients, personnel, appointments. And in all of those areas, there has been a tremendous amount of drama and uncertainty and suspense. President Trump likes to dominate social media, drive the conversation on the cable news cycle. For him, all publicity is good publicity. He said that he would run the White House like a business, and he is, to a certain extent, running it like the reality TV business that he once was in. He likes to have suspense and cliffhangers. He's always saying, we'll see what happens. Generally, that means he hasn't decided yet. Um, and there's teasers, and he invites members of Congress in for these televised meetings where it seems like they're actually working out legislation or hashing out a compromise. Generally, nothing comes of it, but it's a great show. Um, so every president is generally a reaction or an antidote or a correction to the president that came before him. So we had uh, George W. Bush. President Obama was kind of going to be a cerebral, careful uh, president to make up for the, 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 the foreign interventions and messes of the George W. Bush years that pre people had gotten tired of. Then along came Donald Trump. After no drama Obama, you have all drama all the time Trump. I think that was probably the biggest overcorrection we've ever had from one president to another. But what we have now is a lot of tensions and things that we just don't know the answer to. And let me just give you a bunch of things that are the big stories now that we don't know which way the president is going to go. Syria. Okay. Very famously, last week, he announced that he wanted to get out of Syria. He said we were going to leave very soon, in a matter of months. Now he's saying we're about to strike Syria. He tweeted today, get ready, Russia. The missiles are coming nice and new and smart. It's kind of similar to the tweet he did not long ago where he told Kim Jong-un that his nuclear button was bigger than his. So this is a president who famously criticized President Obama for telegraphing in advance what he was going to do when he would leave Iraq or Afghanistan, said that was very terrible thing to do, and here he is doing the same thing. The problem is that exactly one year ago, there was another chemical attack in Syria, just similar to the one that just happened, and President Trump said this has crossed a red line, or in his words, many red lines, and where Obama didn't act, Obama put down a red line in the sand, Syria walked right over it, I'm going to act, and he called for a limited airstrike on a single airfield in Syria. Well, that didn't work because they've used chemical weapons again. Now he's under pressure to do more, something more expansive than that first strike. So the question is, is that going to be another one-off attack, or is it going to draw him further into the conflict, which he just said he wants to pull out of? We have one to 2,000 troops in Syria. His military advisors have told him that he can't just pull out because that could create a vacuum for the Russians and the Iranians and ISIS to fill again. So. What's he going to do in Syria? Will it make a difference? Will it deter the Syrian regime? And what does he do over time there? Does he pull out or does he stick around? So what the strategy is in Syria, not clear. Same thing with tariffs on China. Uh, he has threatened $100 billion in tariffs in addition to the 50 to 60 he initially announced. Um, is that the beginning of a trade war? which the president has tweeted, our trade wars are good and easy to win, or is this just a negotiating ploy? He has bipartisan support for the notion that China is a cheater, China cheats on stealing other countries' intellectual property, um, but Congress, especially Republican leadership in Congress, does not want a trade war that would hurt red states, farmers in red states. So what is it? Is it the beginning of a trade war, or is it just a negotiating ploy? On any given day, Trump's advisors will come out and tell us it's one thing or another, literally. Larry Kudlow on one day will say it's just a negotiating ploy. The next day, he'll say, well, maybe we're going to have a trade war. 
Who knows? Very unclear. Same thing with NAFTA. Is he renegotiating NAFTA or getting ready to terminate it? Also, same thing with North Korea. He has talked about destroying North Korea if they don't denuclearize. Well, he's about to have a summit meeting with Kim Jong-un. What happens if that meeting fails? We don't know. We don't know if his bark is worse than his bite because sometimes he's bluffed and stepped down, retreated. Other times he's followed through on his threats. Um, same thing is true with his new foreign policy team. Lots of staff turnover. The place where it really matters is in foreign policy. He's gotten rid of his national security advisor his, um, and his secretary of state. He now has a new team, much more conservative, harder line um, people like John Bolton and Mike Pompeo. They're more hawkish than the people they're replacing. H.R. McMaster and Rex Tillerson. So does that mean that the risk of war with Iran or North Korea, both of which John Bolton has argued for in the past, is that risk going up? Or is the threat of military action, again, just a negotiating ploy? We don't know. We also don't know if the president, even though he says famously that he likes a diversity of opinions, likes to have people argue it out in front of him, is that what he's got now? Or is he just creating an echo chamber for his own instincts? You know, recently, his trade advisor, Peter Navarro, was on Bloomberg News, and he said, my function as an economist is to try to provide the underlying analytics that confirm Trump's intuition. And his instinct is always right in these matters. So does he want people who are just going to confirm his instincts, or does he truly want a diversity of views? The other big question is, are we entering into a new relationship with Russia? You know, what's been so interesting and a big mystery in the Trump presidency is why has he been a person who is so undisciplined in every way, why has he been so extremely disciplined about never, ever, ever saying a critical word about Vladimir Putin? But for the first time, recently, he did criticize Putin by name. He said Putin, Russia, and Iran are responsible for the um, chemical weapons attack that, that their client, the Syrian regime, conducted. Uh, we, he has at least not stopped his administration from acting with our allies to expel Russian diplomats because of the nerve gas attack in Britain and also because of meddling in the US elections. He, his administration has sanctioned oligarchs. Does that mean that he's changing his views on Putin and Russia? We don't know. But what we do know is that his national security advisor who just left was fired, H.R. McMaster. His parting words were that we have not done enough to deter Russia, and Putin hasn't paid the price for what he's done. Um, so is this, does this mean that Trump is not a total isolationist? When he talked about his America first policies, it sounded like a, it was going to be a complete and radical departure from 70 years of bipartisan consensus about what America's role in the world was. We were the leader of this liberal, rules-based world order that was based on democratic institutions and values and multilateral organizations and alliances. Trump doesn't like multilateral alliances or organizations. He likes to do things unilaterally. He's kind of a militant unilateralist a kind of hawkish non-interventionist, if you can square that circle. So he doesn't like multilateral organizations like the WTO or NATO, he thinks, or NAFTA. He thinks NATO is ripping us off. Um, will Syria change his mind? We don't know. Um, so no one knows this. I think we're in a period of peak uncertainty about Trump. One thing we can say with more confidence is that Trump is increasingly confident doing things his own way. He has actually now gotten his sea legs. He feels liberated. Uh, he doesn't rely on the advice of aides. As a matter of fact, a lot of the people who used to be the guardrails in the White House and kind of can, would talk him down when he would get angry or wanted to lash out or do something impulsive, they have left. Um, and again, he said he'd run the White House like a business. And this is the way he ran his real estate and branding company. All of his decisions came from his gut, very instinctive, impulsive. He's famous for saying, I alone can fix it. I am my own best advisor. So he's 70 years old. Why change now? This got him to the White House. It seems to have worked pretty well so far. Um, the last big question, big piece of suspense in Washington, is what happens to Robert Mueller? Will he or won't he fire 
Mueller by getting rid of either Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, or the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein? Will he shut down the in special counsel's investigation? He's <coughs> super mad about the raid on his lawyer's office. He talked about that for 10 minutes the other day, surrounded by his military advisors. They were having a meeting on Syria. Um, and it seems like he's getting closer to doing that. Um, one of the things that is important to know is he has the legal right to do this. They are members of the executive branch. And recently, Sarah Sanders, the deputy, the uh, White House press secretary, usually in the past when we've said, is, is Donald Trump going to fire Bob Mueller or take steps to get rid of him, she would say he has the absolute authority to do that, but no, he's not contemplating that. He's not going to do that. The caveats have disappeared. The little qualifiers about how, yes, he could do it legally, but no, he's not planning on it, those have disappeared. So it seems like he's getting closer to doing that. Um, what we do know about Mueller is he's getting awfully close to the president. Not only did he raid his personal lawyer's office, but he's indicted his former campaign chairman. That's Paul Manafort. He has got a guilty plea from Trump's former National Security Advisor, he's working on his third now, John Bolton is his third, but his first one, Mike Flynn, pled guilty to lying. Two former campaign aides of Trump's are cooperating with Mueller, and Mueller has said that he wants to interview the president um, about obstruction of justice in the, com the firing of the first FBI director, James Comey. He's been getting some gentle pushback from Republicans in Congress. They don't like to anger the president or stick their finger in his eye, so they've been trying to tell him that firing Mueller would be a really bad idea. Chuck Grassley, conservative Republican from Iowa, said the other day that firing Mueller or even talking about it would be suicide. Mitch McConnell, who's the very kind of tight-lipped majority leader in the Senate, said that Mueller should be allowed to finish his job. And it seems like firing Mueller is a kind of red line for Republicans in Congress. What they do if it happens, we don't know. But we do know that they're communicating to the president that if he did that, he would just be digging the hole that he's in much deeper. Because when he fired Jim Comey, he got Bob Mueller. So just trying to get out from under what the president has called this cloud of investigation often has unintended consequences. The big question for Congress in this matter is when does a Congress act as a check and balance against a president of their own party. And that is a difficult decision. It's easy if you're an opposition Congress. So up until now, Congress has been very quiet, with the exception of Republicans who are not running for re-election again, like Jeff Flake or Bob Corker or Trey Gowdy. No public criticisms of the president. Lots of private grousing, but no public uh, criticisms. Why? because the president is very popular with the base of the Republican Party and they don't want to get crosswise with those voters. Number two, they want him to keep signing legislation, although the fact that the legislative phase is over might make a difference there. Um, and the question is, what would change that for Republicans in Congress? Um, I actually think what would change that is if they lose big in November and decide it was Trump's fault. Um, the other thing that, that you all can watch for that's coming right up is this weekend, Jim Comey starts his book tour, and he's going to start it on Sunday with an interview on This Week on ABC. And Donald Trump has canceled his weekend trip to South America, he says, because he wanted to stay here and oversee the military effort on Syria. But he's going to be in Washington with very little to do but watch television. So we're all buckling our seatbelts for that. Um, so for the same reason that I think Republicans in Congress are for the most part so unwilling to share in public the criticisms of Trump that they are willing to share in private is because American politics is so tribal and so polarized and so hyper-partisan. You kind of stick with your team no matter what. And this is where I want to step back for a minute and talk about the most significant political dynamic in American politics today, and that is polarization. Um, you see it in Congress, first and foremost. There used to be conservative Democrats and liberal to moderate Republicans. People think that's weird, but that's how it used to be. And the overlap between those two groups conservative Democrats, liberal to moderate Republicans, that was the center of the political spectrum. That's where deals got made, compromises got done, that's where common ground was found. But over time, that center has become depopulated. And now there's just a big abyss, generally, between both parties. There's a handful of people who still try to work out compromises, but they often don't work. 
or they can't get votes. So most members of Congress live in safe districts, and the only thing Republicans worry about is a primary challenge from the right. The only thing Democrats worry about is a primary challenge from the left. And the reason this happens is not just gerrymandering, the way congressional districts are drawn to keep incumbents safe, although that plays a big role. It's also because of a phenomenon that sociologists call the big sort. Americans have sorted themselves out so that they live in more homogeneous communities. People tend to live near other people who look like them, think like them, vote like them, worship like them. And for all the diversity in America, there is a tremendous amount of self-segregation, and I don't mean just racially. On social media, we share and like and retweet people we agree with, and we ignore or unfriend or block people we don't agree with. People also tend to consume media that agrees with them. More and more people seem to want affirmation, not information, from their news feeds. And the media itself is polarized. You know, the joke is that Fox and MSNBC don't even cover the same natural disasters. Um, I am the exception to the rule. I've been on Fox for 20, almost 20 years, and I've worked at NPR for 33. Um, so fact-checking doesn't matter anymore. Fact-checking in the news media used to really matter. A politician really cared if they got four Pinocchios from Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post. But now, you know, it doesn't matter. 66% of Americans said Donald Trump wasn't honest and trustworthy. That was before the election. So a lot of those people voted for him anyway. And our politics are so tribal now that a poll taken of Republicans right before the election showed that something like 70% of Republican voters thought the economy was doing terrible. Three days after Donald Trump won the election, they went back to the exact same people and polled them again. And guess what? All of those Republicans said the economy was doing great. Because their team won. Our system is based on compromise and cooperation and restraint. And if we no longer can agree on facts first and then work our way to opinions as opposed to the other way around, it's impossible to have a civil debate and it's impossible to compromise. And too often now, American politics is becoming reality resistant. It doesn't matter what the issues are or what people think about the issues. You just stick with your team and your tribe and your party no matter what. You know, during the campaign, Trump very famously said that he could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and he wouldn't lose any voters. And that's pretty close to, to, to being right. Partisan identity is now the most important identity. Remember back when Mitt Romney, the Republican candidate, said that Russia was our number one geopolitical foe? Well, now 35% of Republicans express confidence in Vladimir Putin. Same thing on trade. Republican Party used to be the free trade party. Along comes Donald Trump, and now de Democrats believe in free trade a lot more than Republicans. Same thing on immigration. Republicans used to be the open party on immigration. Not anymore. So Donald Trump, because he's the leader of the tribe, has managed to remake the party in his own image. Same thing on um, personal behavior, on sexual harassment. Roy Moore, Donald Trump. You know, Republicans are willing to accept that in a way they never would before. So a, it's a lot harder to compromise with the other side if you think your opponent is not just your opponent, but he is evil incarnate. And American politics is just too apocalyptic. That makes it a lot easier to break down the guardrails and all the unwritten norms and traditions of civil society and democracy, it's easier to justify extreme measures like getting rid of the filibuster or saying your opponent should be locked up if you think that electing the other guy is the end of the world. And when we're so tribal and hyperpartisan and divided, the American political system becomes a big, fertile field to plow for bad actors like the Russians and other disinformation campaigns. And that's what happened in the 2016 elections. They couldn't have done this all by themselves. If the Russians' goal of their disinformation campaign was to exacerbate our divisions, undermine our faith in our own election system and the fairness and security of our ballot, and other democratic institutions, well, they were pushing on an open door. 
almost every message that the Russians were sending and amplifying through social media, we were hearing from the top of the ticket. Donald Trump said the election was rigged, the only way he could lose is if it was stolen from him, and that's what you had Russian bots pushing out all day long. So trust in American institutions, all American institutions, was way down before the disinformation campaigns of the 2016 elections. And when you can't trust government, Congress, the White House, the Justice Department, who do you trust? You trust your social media feed, your friends on Facebook, you trust the, the videos you look at on YouTube. Your Facebook friends group is how you get information about conspiracy theories, whether it's Barack Obama was born in Kenya or vaccines cause autism. And trust in your little tribe, your social media world, is way up. Trust in big institutions and society is way down. So why has this trust eroded over time? There are a lot of reasons. One of them, the biggest reason, is just because the system isn't working for enough people. There have been a lot of big changes in American life. For one thing, we've had a period of economic stagnation, and I don't mean just inequality, because people don't mind so much if the rich are getting richer if they're getting richer too. But we've had wage stagnation, slow growth, the income of the typical American family adjusted for inflation is the same today as it was in the 1980s. We have low labor force participation, particularly among men aged 25 to 55, lower marriage rates, globalization's of, uh, uh, successes are uneven and not enough has been done for the losers. We now know that an American child's chances of out-earning their parents has fallen in the last 50 years from 90% to 60%. And that was the American dream. Work hard, play by the rules, get educated, your kids can do better than you do or you can do better than your parents. So the escalators of social and economic mobility seem to be broken. And we've also had all these demographic changes. We've already had the first majority minority kindergarten class. And in some communities, especially white working class communities and white working class male communities, the jobs are gone and they feel their place in society is gone and they are more than willing to listen to someone who comes along and tells them that the reason that happened is because of immigrants. So all of that is a recipe for political volatility. And in the last five out of six elections, we've had change elections. And by that, I mean that the party control of one House of Congress, or both, or the White House, has changed hands. Only 2012 was a status quo election, where all the same players returned. Republicans had the Congress. Barack Obama got reelected. But every other election, we've had a big change in party control. So <coughs> voters keep keep voting for change, but they don't get the change they want, and then they vote for change again, and they don't get the change they want because Congress is gridlocked. So this is why you see populist, nationalist politicians, kind of anti-democratic, meaning anti-little-d democratic, coming up all over the world. It's not just Donald Trump. And the message is very powerful. The system isn't working for you, and I know exactly who to blame. So in a lot of ways, Donald Trump was asking the right questions, and to a lot of his critics, he was just providing the wrong answers. Um, so all of this um, upheaval and change means that right now our democratic institutions are undergoing a kind of stress test. And none of them are undergoing a more intense stress test than the First Amendment, the free press, and the mainstream media. We were under pressure before Donald Trump came along and called us fake news and enemies of the people. And <clears throat> this is what I want to talk about fake news a little bit, and I want to make a differentiation between fake news and real fake news. <laughs> There's fake fake news, meaning fake news as an epithet, fake news as I don't like that, so I'm going to call it fake news, versus real fake news, which is propaganda, lies, inaccuracies. And the problem isn't just that so many people believe conspiracy theories, what I would call real fake news, like Hillary Clinton was involved in a pedophile ring at a pizza parlor, or vaccines cause autism, or Obama is a Muslim, which, by the way, big numbers of Republicans still believe to this day, or the Parkland kids are crisis actors, or global warming is a Chinese hoax, or three to five million people voted illegally in the last election, it's because so much of this fake news 
is amplified and accelerated by social media and Russian bots and the Facebook and Google and YouTube algorithms, that the result is that fewer people believe in real news. People like all of us at NPR who slave every day to get things right and check it, that's bad for democracy. And I've heard it described as an attack on the enlightenment. The idea that individual human beings can use reasoning and science to figure out what objective truth is. There's not always an objective truth in every argument, but there are objective facts. And that truth doesn't just come from your ruler. In other words, your leader just doesn't tell you what to believe. And this is not completely a technological problem, although technology definitely exacerbates it. We just had Mark Zuckerberg testifying for two days in Congress about Facebook. And to many members of Congress, even though from the hearing show they don't necessarily understand how Facebook works, um, and I sympathize with them for that, um, they do start looking at Facebook either as a giant unregulated utility, although they're not quite sure how they want to regulate it yet, and in the past, Facebook always described itself as a neutral platform. Well, now it kind of looks like the biggest surveillance-based enterprise in history. Uh, it looks like a pipeline for Russian propaganda and the biggest publisher on the planet. Zuckerberg told Congress that social media was in an arms race and it was only going to get worse, meaning large networks of Russian fake accounts. In the campaign, Facebook has identified 60 million of these. That's probably a low number. Um, and what they're looking forward to next time around is what's called deep fakes. This is where artificial intelligence is going to be able to manufacture video and audio that will look like, you know, Hillary Clinton said something, but it wasn't really her. And the same thing with Donald Trump. Now, are there ways to determine whether it's fake or not? Of course. But in the last three days of a campaign or the last week of a campaign, that's going to be pretty hard. So we know that during the 2016 campaign, dark ads and tailored messages were, were sent to the exact right Facebook feeds of, for instance, African-American voters in the Midwest telling them that Hillary Clinton was going to jail every one of their children. Or there were messages targeted to young voters to say, if you want to vote for Hillary, all you have to do is text hashtag Hillary, and you can vote by text. How many people fell for that? What was the actual impact on the, on the final vote count? We don't know. Um, but technology amplifies divisions, whether it's a Russian bot or, a, or an alt-right website or some kind of algorithm. We know that in the last three months of the campaign, the top performing fake news items on Facebook got more engagements than the top stories on the Washington Post, New York Times, and NBC combined. And just to give you an example of how this works, when Trump made his first attack on kneeling NFL players, he did it in a speech in Alabama. And within hours, there was a, um, a network of Russian bots retweeting that thousands and thousands and thousands of times um, and amplifying it. Um, so the Russian disinformation campaign um, plus the Facebook and YouTube business model, kind of the way social media works, um, plus you know, computational propaganda and American divisions all add up to an attack on democratic institutions. And look, disinformation campaigns are not new. I mean, the snake in the Garden of Eden was probably the first disinformation campaign. But they are just amplified and exacerbated and multiplied by an incredible amount now. This year is the 50th anniversary of 2001, A Space Odyssey, where the astronaut at the end has to dismantle the homicidal computer, Hal. And the question is, what is our incentive to rein this in today? Is there a way to actually change or regulate the business model of Facebook so it's, they don't have an incentive to send out, not just to amplify messages that exacerbate divisions, but if you watch YouTube, and you click, you, you're interested in seeing something about the alt-right, they have an algorithm that will continue to send you more and more extreme videos because they know that you'll stay longer because the research they've done about the human brain, you'll stay longer on those and they can sell more ads. Um, so this is a much bigger problem than whether the Donald Trump campaign colluded with the Russians. That is a problem and we hope to get the final answer on that, but this other stuff is a much bigger problem. 
So I talked about a stress test on democratic institutions. The press obviously is at the forefront of this. Congress is too. The big question is, you know, when do they act as a check and balance? The judiciary, I think, is going under a stress test. Um, for the very first time in American history, we have a president who has regularly attacked the independent judiciary, whether he's just venting and blowing off steam and he's justifiably angry at being investigated, um, or whether his rhetoric is really undermining people's faith in law enforcement and an independent court system depends on your point of view. But he has called the FBI corrupt. He's called the CIA and the entire intelligence community. He's compared them to Nazi Germany. He's attacked individual judges. During the campaign, famously, he attacked one judge for being Mexican. The guy was born in the United States. The, guy, the judge who was presiding over uh, his, the uh, Trump University case. He has said the whole court system should be blamed if there was a terror attack because they were uh, ruling against his Muslim ban. He's fired the FBI director, which he is perfectly within his rights to do, but he said at the time that it was to get out from under the cloud of the Russia investigation. He has expressed with some regret that he can't direct the FBI and the Justice Department to prosecute Hillary Clinton. Um, but what do we think is happening with the judiciary? I would say that they're coming through the stress test pretty well. Bob Mueller hasn't been fired, at least not since I started talking, I don't think. We could check. You can tell me if he has been. Um, in a fake democracy like Russia, the campaign chairman of the president of the United States would never be arrested for money laundering. So I would say the rule of law, separation of powers, free press, under pressure, but intact. Then there is the next and most important democratic institution, and that's you, citizens. So I would say that we saw a corrosion of support for first American principles for a long time now. It didn't start with Donald Trump. He might have accelerated it. But here are just some depressing statistics. 28% of Americans think that the federal government should have the power to revoke licenses of networks if the government thinks that they are fake news. 43% of people agree that colleges should have the right to ban controversial speech, and only 59%, sounds like a big number, but only 59% say that religious freedom in the U.S. should apply to all religions. Only 26% of Americans can name all three branches of government, and only 40% can name one right guaranteed by the First Amendment. But, 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 there is also some good news, and that is that more people are getting involved in politics. More people are running for office, from dog catcher to school board to the House of Representatives. More people are attending town halls. More people are consuming news from every possible source, but especially mainstream news organizations. Um, <clears throat> there are more first-time candidates now than we've ever had before, more first-generation Americans running for office, more women running for office. Some of this is the Donald Trump effect. There are a lot of these first-time candidates who said, I didn't have any qualifications or experience in politics, and I thought I couldn't run. And then I saw Donald Trump and said, why, if he can do it, I can too. Um, most of these, the preponderance of these candidates are Democrats, but there are also a lot of Republicans too. More people are pushing for real civics education in K through 12 uh, classrooms, kind of media literacy, democracy 101, um, and there is a backlash to Facebook. So all of those things are hopeful. You know, American citizens, I think, are rising to the challenge. And that brings us to the 2018 elections, which I think is shaping up to be another change election. The House of Representatives is in play. The Democrats need 23 seats pick up to take the majority there. On the Senate side, the Republicans are in much better shape. They have a more favorable map. Um, there are a lot of red state Democratic Senate incumbents running for re-election in states that Donald Trump won. So conceivably, the Republicans could pick up a couple of seats in the Senate. The Democrats could pick up a couple of seats in the Senate, or it could be just a wash, which would actually be a huge victory for Democrats because they're in a very, um, they're really playing defense there. The big question is, if we are going to have a blue wave this year, a kind of surge of Democrats, um, how big will the wave be, and will it be enough to wash over the Republicans' structural defenses, which are formidable? They have the mighty fortress of redistricting. They've been able to draw congressional districts to keep their uh, incumbents safe. They have a lot more money. 
And we know, but on the other hand, they are facing a lot of headwinds. We know from history that the party in power, especially when it has the House and Senate, loses seats in the first term midterm. Presidents with approval ratings of under 50% and especially under 45% tend to lose even more seats. We know that midterms are a referendum on the president and the party in power. And right now, Donald Trump is somewhere between 39 and 43% approval ratings. That is historically extremely low. I think it's the lowest of any president at this time in his term. But those ratings are very, very stable. It tells you that even though he has a narrow trading range, his base is pretty solid. Um, like he said, he could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and he wouldn't lose any voters. And he's been there pretty much the whole, the whole time of his presidency with a little bit of bouncing around. Um, he has delivered for his voters. He might not have been able to build the wall yet, but he has kept his focus on illegal immigration. He's delivered on social issues. He has slapped tariffs on uh, Chinese goods. He got out of the Paris Climate Accord. These are all things he promised to do. Um, the only thing he did to anger his base voters was to sign that big $1.3 trillion omnibus spending bill, which did not include money to build the wall, and he got, for the very first time, a real sharp backlash from a lot of conservatives, especially on Fox News, where he spends a lot of time watching. And they didn't like it that there wasn't money for the wall, and they didn't like it that it also included a lot of Democratic priorities, like funding for Planned Parenthood. So what happened immediately after that, he went back to the touchstone issue of his campaign, which is illegal immigration, and he decided to send the military to the border. So the other thing we know from inside the polling numbers, in, be, beyond the top line numbers that just tell you what his approval rating is, we know that the intensity in this election is on the Democratic side. So 58% of the people who approve of Donald Trump approve of him very strongly. But 81% of the people who disapprove of Donald Trump disapprove of him very strongly. So you can see the intensity is on the other side. And there is even a bigger problem, it's a long-term problem for the Republican Party, and that is <coughs> that white women with college degrees are just deserting the Republicans in droves. And young people, Donald Trump and the Republican Party both have a 19% approval rating among people 18 to 34 years old. That is the growing part of the electorate. That's not where you want to be. You know. Um, we also know that in the generic ballot, there's a question on every poll called the generic ballot, and it just means if the election were held today, would you vote for the generic Democrat or the generic Republican? Democrats have a small lead there, somewhere between five and 10 points, but because of the big sort, which I talked about, uh, they need to have a really big advantage in the generic ballot because they are, Democrats are massed inefficiently in urban areas. They um, are not efficiently distributed like Republican voters are in rural areas. So just to give you an example of how that plays, in 2016, Republicans only got 49% of the national vote for the House of Representatives, but they still ended up with 55% of the seats because their voters are distributed efficiently around the country. They're spread out, whereas Democrats are clumped together in urban areas and they win these races by huge margins, but that's, a, that's wa uh, wasted votes. You only need to win a raised by 50.1%. Um, but we also know that Republicans are underwater right now with white women, and that hasn't happened since 2007. So that's what we know from the past. We also know that historical rules only work till they stop working, and that Trump, we know, has defied the laws of political gravity in 2016. We don't know if he can do it again without being on the ballot himself. Uh, what we do know, we have a handful of special elections that we've had. We have the Alabama Senate race and the Virginia governor's race and this congressional race in Pennsylvania 18 to replace um, a Republican congressman who had to resign because he was a very strong anti-abortion uh, Republican who encouraged his mistress to have an abortion and he had to step down. A Democrat won that race. We know that in all of these races, Democrat, Democratic turnout is way up over what it was in past elections. Republicans are still turning out, it's just the Democrats are turning out more. Um, we also know that Democrats are running candidates in every House race. That has never happened before. They've always left races uncontested. They've kind of left things on the field. But um, this year, there are 70 Democrats who are running uncontested, where the Republicans haven't fielded a candidate. So that's new, because Democrats 
want to be on their surfboards, standing in the water, ready if a big wave comes. It doesn't matter if it's a big wave election if you don't have candidates running in every race. That's what happened in the past. Democrats haven't been able to take advantage of, of uh, wave elections because they haven't been able to field enough candidates. Um, so we also know that there have been a lot of retirements, including today, the biggest one of all. Um, Paul Ryan, the speaker, said he's not going to run again. That was just huge. That is an, a big vote of no confidence in the Republicans' chances to take back the House. They already have a record high number of retirements, I think 46. Not every single one of those is retiring from a competitive seat. Some of them are committee chairmen who are term limited and just basically don't want to come to Congress, come back to Congress as a rank and file member. They can't run a committee. But, um, you know, there are a lot of retirements. I predict that Paul Ryan stepping down is going to encourage a lot of other ones to do the same thing. So Trump has a loyal base, but he also motivates Democrats to come out and vote against him. And what we know about the transitive property of politics is it only works one way. In other words, the presidential popularity doesn't tend to transfer to other candidates of their party, but if a president's unpopularity does, just ask Barack Obama in 2010 and 2014. Um, the Pennsylvania House race was really interesting because Trump had won that district by 20 points in 2016, and a Democrat won. And there are 100 other districts that are less Republican than that district there. So that was a big morale booster for Democrats. Um, so what are the issues that the parties are going to run on this year? I think for Democrats, Trump is the issue. It almost goes without saying. Uh, they're going to present themselves as a check and balance on Trump. They're going to run on health care. They're going to, in some districts, they'll want to run on gun control. They're also going to run as antidotes to chaos and division. When you look at Connor Lamb in the 18th Congressional District in Pennsylvania, Doug Jones in Alabama, Ralph Northam in Virginia, these are centrist, middle of the road, pragmatic, decent, low-key candidates. They are not the left-wing mirror image of Donald Trump. They are not Bernie Sanders Democrats. Um, even the Parkland kids, I mean, I know they're not running for office, but what was so interesting about those marches is they're not out there in the streets saying, shut it down, let's tear down the establishment. This is not 60s-style activism. This is super practical. This is like the League of Women Voters. Um, you know, they're talking about registering to vote, voting, and banning high-capacity magazines. That's pretty granular, specific, little c civics um, activism. So I see, um, so that's what I think is going to be the contours of the election. The Republicans on the other side, I think, are going to be running on immigration. They're going to be running on impeachment, which is interesting. They're going to be saying that Democrats are going to impeach Trump if they take back the House. Democrats aren't running on impeachment. They think that's number one stupid as a tactic, but also even stupid as a, as a goal. You have to do an investigation first before you impeach someone. Impeaching, saying you want to impeach Trump is the exact same thing as him running on locker up, locker up. You know, that's, um, so, the, but the Republicans would like to do that. They also are going to run on the economy if they can, and tax cuts. The problem for Republicans is that they want to talk about tax cuts and the good economy, but Donald Trump keeps changing the subject. The other day he went to give a tax reform speech in West Virginia, and remember he took the speech and he threw it up in the air. He said, this is so boring, I want to talk about something else. Um, now, the other thing Republicans are worried about is if there is a trade war, and they also now, we now have these huge trillion dollar deficits. Is that going to undermine the positive effects of the tax cuts and economic growth? Um, tariffs really split the Republican base. Steel workers like it. Farmers don't like it. Um, that's a real problem. They also have a dilemma, which is if they stay faithful to Donald Trump, they could turn off suburban women, centrist voters, independents. But if they break with the president, they could depress turnout for hard their core Republicans. So one of the big mysteries of the 2018 election so far to me is we have low unemployment, we have low inflation, the economy is pretty good, and consumer confidence is also really good. Why isn't the economy helping Republicans and Donald Trump more? Now maybe it is. Maybe he would be at 32% if we were in a bad economy. We're not quite sure about that. Um, or maybe some of the voters who are actually benefiting most from the tax cuts, highly educated, middle class and upper middle class suburban voters with 401ks, 
They like the economy, but their dislike of Trump's behavior and character are overwhelming their feelings about the economy. Um, it's kind of like, we like the economy, we don't like you. And usually in midterm elections, the electorate favors Republicans. In midterm elections, the electorate is older, whiter, more rural, more married, more religious, more educated. All those things, except for the last one, are really good for Republicans. More education now correlates with, with being against Trump. Um, so we don't know who's going to turn out in the election. We know who used to turn out. Uh, we also know that the stakes are very high for Democrats. The stakes are higher for Democrats than Republicans this year. Why? Because they're in such a deep hole. For every president loses seats for his party nationally over the course of eight years, but no president has lost as many seats as Barack Obama. He lost more than a thousand Democratic seat, elect, uh, elected officials in every, in every, at every level, state legislatures, House, Senate. So, and the Democrats had the very bad luck to lose, and the Republicans had the very good luck, to surge in 2010. If you're going to have a big surge, take over a lot of state legislatures, win seats in Congress, you want to do it in a year with a zero at the end of it. Because every 10 years we take the census and then we redraw the congressional districts. We have a 10 year, every 10 years is redistricting. So what happened after 2010 when the Republicans surged, took over all these seats, got like the both chamber, chambers of the state legislature and the governor's mansion in many, many states, they were able to control the redistricting process and they drew these congressional districts to keep Republicans safe uh, for the next 10 years. Well, we're coming up on another year with a zero at the end of it. Democrats are determined to win state legislature races. In the past, they never paid attention to them. This was the great curse of Democrats. First of all, they couldn't turn out their voters every two years. They could only turn them out every four. Republicans vote every two years, no matter what. And also, they never paid attention to state legislatures. You know, that was a huge failing. Um, here are some wild cards that I think could affect the election. One is the activism of young people. What happens to all that energy around the Parkland students? Will it last? We know the history. You know, we have a terrible mass shooting, burst of activism, and then it just dissipates. Um, we know that young people don't turn out. In 2016, in a presidential year, only 30% of people turned out who were 18 to 29, only 40% who were 30 to 44. You know, when you're between 45 and 64, 62% of those people turn out. So what happens to that activism for gun control, which would help Democrats? Will we be in a trade war? Will there be a Supreme Court retirement? If there is, that will definitely gin up energy on the right. Will Mueller get fired? And here's a kind of obscure one, but to me, the teacher strikes in red states are really, really interesting. Um, and I don't know exactly what that does. Uh, I think it would be helpful for Democrats, but these are in states where Democrats have a really hard time, but that's something to watch. So I will end by just saying it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future, um, even the future in November. But I do think we're going to have another change election. Um, and the other thing to remember is that nothing has happened yet, meaning we haven't faced a crisis, an external crisis. Every little crisis has pretty much been of Donald Trump's own making. But we haven't had an Ebola epidemic. We haven't had a ter big terrorist attack. Nothing has actually happened yet. So, and if something does, that, you know, we don't know what it would be, but that also could change the whole picture. So. I'll stop talking and we'll have Q&A. Okay, Is it? Hello, hello, yep. It should be just on. I didn't do Hello? Oh, yeah. there you go. Um, well, that certainly gave us a lot of information to um, ask questions about. We want to open it up to you all. There's already somebody here at this side, and then if anybody over here wants to go afterwards, you can come on this side as well. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your, uh, your analysis. It was terrific. I I'm curious if you think um, it's kind of a two-headed question. A, if there is any possibility that a moderate Republican could make inroads in the, in the Republican Party nationally. 
And also, when you ticked off the three Democrats who were successful in uh, Alabama, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and noted the pragmatic nature of them, if you think that pragmatism can possibly extend to the national political party when the primary season comes around and they nominate a presidential candidate again? Well, those are really good questions. Uh, the first one about whether a moderate Republican could make inroads. I don't think that, I think Donald Trump will be primaried. I don't think he can be defeated in a primary because the base of the party is a, is a, is a Trumpist base. Um, you know, the party has gotten just much more anti-immigrant, anti-free trade. It's kind of becoming a white working class xenophobic party. But I do think there will be a challenge to him. Now, will John Kasich primary him or will he run as a third party in the general election? We don't know as an independent candidate. But there's still, um, the Republican establishment is still moderate, still believes in all the things it used to believe in, but um, the party has become a Trump party. So I don't know exactly where that energy goes. Where do the Jeff Flakes and the Bob Corkers and even the Mitt Romneys, you know, what happens to them? Um, in terms of the Democrats, the thing that Democrats are doing this year in these races that's interesting and correct is they're nominating candidates that fit their different districts. I mean, Connor Lamb fit his district. Now, if you're running in, in some urban area in New York, you can be more liberal. But, but they're not Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, left-wing candidates. They're not the left-wing mirror image of Trump. What happens in 2020 is something different because the energy in the Democratic base nationally is more left. Um, but there is a big debate in the Democratic Party about which way do you go? You know, do you try to get back some of those white working class votes that you used to have and lost to Trump? Or do you just try to increase turnout among, you know, young people and minorities? I mean, most Democrats will say, of course, we have to do both. Um, they're just not, they're, you can't abandon one, one chunk of the electorate or not. I think you're going to have a big fight in the Democratic Party about exactly this. Um, and they're going to really want to defeat Donald Trump. And I wonder if they think that Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren can do that. You know, or do they need someone like Joe Biden, as old as he is, um, you know, that's a kind of return to normalcy, somebody who could relate to the white working class, um, running on a ticket with, I predict, if he gets a nomination, a woman of color or a, or a male of color, but that's what's gonna happen. You have to represent the whole party. I have so many questions, so I have to pick which one. But so the one thing um, that has that I've thought since before Donald Trump was elected, following him his whole career, to me, there's nothing about him that's changed. He is who he always was, and he's very predictable to me. But that there, I don't see any scenario where there would be a peaceful transition of power, and that. Yes, a lot of people said that about Barack Obama, too, who were against him. You know, I, I, I'd hear it all the time that, that he wanted to be king. But to me, this is, I mean, it's different. You, we don't want to get apocalyptic, but sometimes it, this, this feels more apocalyptic than anything I've lived through. Do you think that the, in, do you think that's a possibility? And do the institutions that we have in place, are they prepared to handle a scenario where that doesn't happen. Okay, so the, <coughs> obviously, I mean, it goes without saying, but the hallmark of a functioning democracy is a peaceful transition of power, and you accept losing when you lose. The difference between, I'd never heard about that, about people saying Barack Obama wasn't gonna leave office after two terms. Whoa, I'd never heard that. Donald Trump said during the campaign that the only way he could lose is if it was stolen from him. And he never actually came out and said he would accept the results if he didn't win. So that was always a question. What would he do? Would he tell his supporters to go into the streets? I mean, what, what would he have done if he lost? Um, so we don't know. You know, you're saying if he, if he loses in 2020, would he actually accept it and leave office? I mean, I can't even wrap my mind around that. It's like, that would be just a crisis of, of just you know, apocalyptic proportions, and I don't really know what would happen at that point. There's, so, that's so, I mean, it would really depend. If it was really close, would he be, you know, you know, what, what, what would be the circumstances for that? But there's no doubt that he has 
um, uh, introduce that idea into the debate because of what he said in 2016. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned earlier on in your talk about the increased polarization um, and how it's related to the fake news and news media and all of that. And I was wondering what you, but in other period around the turn of the century, there is, you know, the newspapers and news media wasn't exactly uh, fair. There's all this yellow news, there's the, um, whatever, the war we started with Cuba. Um, and I was wondering, <clears throat> how would you describe like the difference between now and then? Because at that point in time, at least as far as I'm aware, it wasn't as polar as it is now. Well, we've had, we had tremendously partisan journalism before. You're absolutely right. I mean, there was, you know, news, well, first of all, there were a ton of newspapers and they all represented different points of view. Um, I just think that, you know, people have made analogies to the Civil War that we've never been as divided as then or 1968. Um, the difference, I think, is at the turn of the century, that was really, that was a whole different world. But in the modern era, kind of the post-World War II era, this is a very, we're in a very period of intense disaggregation. In other words, there's no common set of facts. We don't all watch the same three television networks. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of isolated in our own little Facebook funnels, you know, where we like get this stuff from we think trusted people and they're telling us, you know, that Hillary Clinton is a, is a pedophile and gee, it comes from my friends. Well, they have no idea that like half their friends are Russian bots, you know? Um, so this, I, I don't, I'm not saying that we haven't been as polarized before, but this is something new and different because of technology and also because the faith in the, in the kind of liberal rules-based order is weakening because it hasn't delivered enough for everyone. The, the secret sauce to a stable functioning democratic capitalist system is widely shared prosperity. And if you can't get that, you are going to have Brexit, you're going to have Donald Trump, you're going to have Viktor Orban. You know, widely shared prosperity is kind of the key to you know, a more harmonious politics, or just a pol I don't know, harmonious, that's even too far, too much to hope for. Just a politics that can compromise and can work out problems. Um, so that's, that's the big, um, you know, that's the big challenge, I think, facing people. And of course, what some people are worried about is that what the Republican Congress has just done with this, hum you know, they used to care about deficits, that's, I should have mentioned that, trade, immigration, deficits, all those things are no longer priorities for the, for the Republican Party, but that they've blown such a big hole in the deficit that it's going to be, that, they, that they're exacerbating all the problems they want to, want to fix. They, they wanted to, to make growth faster, more jobs, this might have the opposite effect because we're in a period of, of uh, we're not in a recession. This is the time that we should be running tiny deficits and getting ready to spend money in case we run into another recession. But we have now closed that avenue off to us by, by spending so much. Can we go over here? No, we have one over So thank you very much. It's very interesting. And I do enjoy your reporting. But I'm wondering, um, I would like to hear a little more self-analysis of your profession. For example, is there a way in this time for journalists to be less reactive? For example, I ask myself every day, why is the media retweeting and retweeting Donald's tweet? Retweets. Is there another way to report on what's happening without being his echo chamber? And how, you know, given that, how are there different ways that journalists could be better? doing what you do. Okay, there, well, there, first of all, there's a lot of different kinds of journalism. There is long form journalism. There are really good magazines. You know, you read Foreign Policy Magazine, they're not retweeting Donald Trump's tweets. They're telling you something about Syria or, or Afghanistan. Um, but you watch cable news, which has 24 hours a day to fill and not enough material to fill it with, you're gonna get Donald Trump's tweets like regurgitated and chewed over and discussed ad nauseum. My son, who's 14, came into the room and what was, I can't even remember what the news story, breaking news story was, but he, my husband was watching CNN and after a while, Eli said, but they just said that 10 minutes ago. 
They're just repeating themselves. He thought it was completely ridiculous, but that's what they do. And um, I think that we can't, you know, when, when Donald Trump came in, we all had all our editorial meetings. What do we do about the tweets? He's the president of the United States. This is how he's communicating with the American people. We can't ignore them. We have to report on them. Do you know there's a, um, I don't, there's a, there's a function on my Twitter feed at least that translates his tweets into the format of an official uh, release from the White House. So it comes, it comes in your Twitter feed with the uh, letterhead of the way that they would release something and it has, you know, with all caps and the, the exclamation points. This is how the President of the United States is communicating. The, the leader of the free world is communicating with the rest of the world. So we can't ignore it, we have to explain it, we have to try to figure out if it means anything. Um, but I do think there is a need for exactly what you're talking about, and it is out there. You know, it is out there. You just have to be a pretty um, omnivore news consumer. You know, you have to go out there and find different sources. I often recommend people go to something like Real Clear Politics, which is an aggregator. It's a website that will give you every story on a certain subject from an entire spectrum of news organizations. Um, you know, try not to just get news from a source that you agree with. Um, but also, the news media isn't one thing, and there are plenty of journalists who are trying to do longer, more thoughtful stories. We were going back and forth. You guys can duke it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've touched a little bit on, that was a really good segue into my question, actually. So you've touched a little bit on media literacy and reading things that you don't agree with. We are a fairly self-selecting group of people. So what advice do you have for us as far as taking things back to our friends and to the general public about media literacy and, and finding those things yeah. that maybe you don't agree well, with? Well, there is, I mean, I don't think it's reached critical mass, but there's a lot of media literacy stuff out there. There's curriculum now for K through 12 about how, what is a source? You know, how, how, do you, how do you see, you know, when you read something in a story, is it sourced at all? How can you back, to, what's the difference between a primary source and a secondary source and what, what uh, sources are credible and what aren't? Um, there are, uh, there's a news, new organization, I don't think it's come online yet, it's called NewsGuard, and it's started by Stephen Brill and Gordon Krovitz. C Gordon Krovitz used to be a publisher of the Wall Street Journal, and it's going to be not really a rating system, but it's going to be a guide for people to, to determine whether the sources are credible or not. I mean, some people don't even know the difference between Breitbart and, um, I don't know, the Washington Post. I mean, it's just and, you know, when you get in your news feed all these fake things like usatodaynews.com, like, that's not USA Today. Um, so, so there's definitely media literacy. I think, I hope, there's going to be a big demand for real civics education, education about what democracy is. Um, you know, one thing that I always, just what I just said before, go to a news aggregator. Don't just get your news from one source or from people that you agree with. Um, and also, you know, get out of your little bubble. What is it that Barack Obama said? If you're tired of arguing with someone on the internet, how about having a conversation with them in real life? You know, that helps too. Uh, long time listener, thank you for being here. I had two quick questions. Um, you mentioned the census in 2020. What do you think will happen with the states and cities suing over the question yeah. of, are you a US yeah. citizen? Okay, the, 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 the debate over the census is that, um, the census by law is supposed to enumerate all people, not just all citizens. But one of the things that um, um, Wilbur Ross, who's the Secretary of Commerce who runs the census, wants to do is add a question on the census, are you a citizen? So what he's saying is, well, we just want to know, you know, who's a citizen and who's not. But the states that are suing them say that is going to send a chilling effect through immigrant communities and they're not going to want to participate in the census so there's going to be an undercount. In other words, um, they're afraid that if they say something, their cousin would be deported or whatever. So that would mean that states with big immigrant populations will be undercounted. They could lose a congressional seat. They could lose federal funding. There are all sorts of ramifications for that. Well, how I think this is going to end up, I don't know. But it's not just blue states. It's also Texas. I mean, 
lot of Hispanics. You know, a lot of Hisp Hispanics. And what I think is also going to happen is um, there's been so much voter suppression and so much effort to make it harder for newly naturalized citizens to vote and to kind of send this very scary message that, you know, if you're a, a newly naturalized citizen or if you're a Hispanic and you go to vote, we're going to go deport your cousin who's, you know, who's undocumented. I mean, there's a lot of ways that um, you can suppress votes if, if you want to. So that's a big fight. I don't know what's going to happen with it. Um, you know, there always was a citizenship question on another census form, not the one that they take to actually count the population. I forget what the name of the other one was. Um, so why is it, so I guess these people who are suing, yeah, American Community Survey. So the states that are suing are saying, isn't, why isn't that enough? What do you think will happen if and when the president fires Bob Mueller? What do you think Congress will do? Um, you know, that's the big question that every, we all think about and talk about every single day. Um, the question is, will the Republican Congress um, pass a law to, to protect him, and couldn't you do that after he's already been fired? That's a little unclear to me. The thing that's so interesting about this idea of firing Bob Mueller, if he does it before November, I think it could help Democrats. And if Democrats take over the House, they're going to have Bob Mueller testifying seven days a week, literally. Like all day. That's all it's going to be is the Bob Mueller show. So, so just like firing Comey begat Mueller, and just, it didn't help Donald Trump. It had the opposite effect. Firing Bob Mueller will not get him out from under this investigation. First of all, what Bob Mueller did by handing off this stuff to the U.S. Attorney in the su Southern District of New York, it's kind of like sending a letter. Honey, if I don't come back from, from uh, you know, the war, open this letter. You know, it's like an insurance policy. So the investigation is going to continue. Uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, You've had a distinguished career in journalism, uh, and I was wondering if you had any words of wisdom for someone coming into the, trying to become a journalist in it. <laughs> oh my God, it's hard, it's harder now, it's harder now. Um, but it's still a great profession. Um, I've worked for the same place for 33 years. That's unheard of now. I started when I was 10. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, it's when I think about like these young people who, first of all, you have to be proficient on every platform known to mankind and about 10 other ones that haven't been invented yet. Um, plus there's, and you know, half of them are like working as contract employees or freelancers and that's really hard. But <coughs> I would just say, you know, go for it. You know, just go for it. And, and there's a million places to work and some people, some of them don't pay very well. Um, but there's tremendous innovation and churn and, um, you know, it's, it's, look, I've never really thought about my profession as being like a linchpin of democracy, but now I do. And it's really important. And the more people who are inspired to become journalists, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I think we have time for a couple more. Hi, um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, big fan of yours and your work. Um, if the House slips to the Democrats this November, do you think Nancy Pelosi will be speaker, or is there another party leader that you can see taking on the role of speaker? That is an excellent question, and at the, Paul Ryan stepping down, I think, puts a little more pressure on her to also step down. She's a historic figure, first woman speaker, but she is old. There is a desire on the part of many Democrats to have a fresh face. Um, also, she's become a lightning rod. You know, she's like the way Democrats used to run against Newt Gingrich, Republicans run against her. Um, so I, you know, I think that she will be sorely tempted to become speaker again, obviously, but I think there will be a move to have somebody new. Um, there's a guy named Joe Crowley. Joe, is that his first name? Pardon? From New York, from Staten Island, I think, or Queens. He looks like a Trump voter. You know, and um, uh, that you know he's somebody who would who would probably run for it. Steny Hoyer, who's the number two, is also really old. He's from Maryland, you know. But um, so I think there is a push to get to to want to have uh, new faces, and I think Paul Ryan stepping down kind of, you know, increases that pressure. Hi, 
Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. It was very, very Thanks interesting for having me. hearing your talk. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is um, I'm, I'm a history minor here, and I learn a lot about, um, and I, I th I'm also a psychology major. I think a lot about how the psychology of the past reflecting it in the future. Um, I recently read Sinclair Lewis's book, It Can't Happen Here. And That's a good book to read now. Great book. Along with 1984. Yes. <laughs> um, but, and I noticed a lot of similarities in um, in the Great Depression and the rise of fascism in right. Germany, um, and also a lot of similarities between um, the the dystopian character in It Can't Happen Here and President Trump. So I was wondering if you, as a political analyst, think that anything drastic could really come of that, or if we will stay in this in this way that we are now? I don't think something apocalyptic and like dramatic, like in a movie, will happen, like all of a sudden. But I do think we could see an erosion of democratic norms. It happens kind of slowly. Um, democracies can collapse or devolve. There's no doubt about that. And I would say what we learned in the 2016 election was how fragile our democratic institutions are and how easily manipulated they are. Um, and how it's up to every single one of us to protect them because nobody's going to do it for us. And um, I, yeah, I think that's a possibility. It's funny, you know, this whole idea of like we're in the 30s. You know, I'm guilty of that too. I mean, I came out of the studio on election night and my first thought was, I can't believe this. My mother lived through the 30s. Why do I have to live through the 30s? But you know what? It's not the 30s. It's now, and we have tremendous tools, and social media can be used for good or for evil. And, you know, I don't think, if, if people make a concerted effort to protect democratic institutions, they'll be protected. Um, you know, I don't think, um, even though it's, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, people rejecting, you know, liberal democracy and all the, the norms and traditions that make it strong, um, that protect minority rights, I don't mean racial minorities, I mean minorities, pluralism is important. You know, populism is the idea that the majority just rules no matter what. Um, and our system has so many safeguards for minorities and, and, and so much pro-pluralism in it. I don't see that happening. On the other hand, it's like, if it's not gonna happen, it's up to us to make sure it doesn't. We take time for one more. Okay. Uh, you talked about a lot of different, oh, that's what my voice sounds like, okay. Um, you talked about a lot of different <laughs> and uh, important various issues today, and I appreciate your insight on that. Um, sometimes it feels like news outlets are repeating themselves and also repeating other news outlets, you know? Right now it's like Trump and Russia, Trump and Stormy Daniels, and like a little bit of Syria. Yeah. Um, if there's one issue that you think is underreported or underrepresented, uh, in the news media. For me, it's gerrymandering. Um, I think that's a really important one. Uh, but if you could touch on something that, just your opinion, something that you wish was reported more. Well, that's a really good question. I think gerrymandering is important. And now, gerrymandering is a dry subject, but when it goes before the Supreme Court, it'll get covered. You know, it is, you know, when that decision comes down. Um, you know, Stormy Daniels is about sex and a porn star, so that's always going to get over-covered. Um, anything to do with Trump it seems to be, you know, something that cable networks think will get ratings. But if you listen to two hours of Morning Edition or All Things Considered, you're gonna get a pretty big variety of stuff. Um, here's one thing that's undercovered. Puerto Rico still doesn't have 100% of electricity back. I mean, that's really, you know. I think there have been some incredible stories like how expensive it is to be poor. Um, you know, that's an amazing story. Just, just, and the whole kind of uh, criminal justice system and the fines and, you know, that it's, there, there's, um, and that stuff is being covered. It's just if you plop yourself in front of the TV and turn on cable news, you're not going to see it. And, you know, that's the problem. You have to kind of search it out. Um, but one of the things that I also think I predict it will get covered more, but, you know, Every news organizations want, wanted to do penance and make up for their their failings, and we decided that we'd all cover the white working class more because it was a failing that we didn't cover them enough. We didn't understand. We didn't see Trump coming. Blah blah blah. So there's been a tremendous number of stories going to these Trump Trump land, Trump community, seeing you know they still support him. Yes, they do. 
But what we haven't done is go look at the places where he's lost support, like suburban women or people who, who thought that he would do great and he would be run the country like a businessman and what, what's changed. And also, I've been hearing anecdotally that older people, older Americans, who really provided the backbone of his support are also changing their minds. And there have been stories from uh, retirement homes where people are kind of disgusted with his behavior just because they were the greatest generation and they didn't behave like this. Um, so there's, there's lots of things that are undercovered. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. And thank you, Mara Liason, for such an engaging dialogue.